Good day everyone, welcome to our today's discussion and the topic is regulation of energy sector and sustainable development. Can it go together? And I would like to introduce, it's my great pleasure to introduce you uh, our two guests today. Uh, on my left hand side is a visiting professor from Texas Tech University School of Law, Mr. Christopher S. Kulander. Professor teaches oil and gas law, energy law, mining law, and also specializes in shale and oil gas regulatory issues and has also done research projects in various other fields of energy sector. The other participant of today's discussion is Mr. Martinez Nagarichus. Mr. Martinez is President of Lithuanian Confederation of Renewable Resources and Managing Director of Lithuanian Energy Consultants Association. He is also an advisor of a mayor of Vilnius City, Mr. Artura Zogas. Mr. Nagarchus is also Associated Professor of Vilnius Gedimino University of Technology and teaches various courses of renewable energy. So, we have introduced our guests and let us proceed with a discussion. So, the first section of the discussion is uh, about combining general uh, uh, state interest with public interest in greenfield energy projects. Is there any best model to manage such most, most of the time different interests? And uh, I would like to ask Professor Kulander, what is your experience from the United States and what lessons can be learned here in Lithuania, especially having in mind current buzz around shale gas extraction as well as development of other large energy projects as windmill power plants mm -hmm. and etc. Two things come to mind. The first thing that I think is very important to keep in mind is that renewable energy will play an important role in the energy portfolio of Lithuania and other developed countries. So it's going to play a role, not an exclusive role, but an important role along with other forms of energy. It needs however, government support to be currently competitive with other types of energy sources. However, that's, that's, that's the first point. The second point that I would like to make is that government sources of support need to keep in mind that there is a law of diminishing returns with providing support to green energy. Past a certain point in the United States, we have not seen adequate um, uh, increase in efficiency in green energy in some, in some cases. So there needs to be steady government support to make renewable sources of energy, particularly to establish the initial capital investment needed for windmills or other projects. However, there should not be uh, a willy-nilly or pell-mell um, uh, turning on of the spigot of money or turning off of the spigot of money of government support depending on what political regime is in, is in control. There needs to be steady support, realistic um, expectations, and if that's the case, I see that renewable energy will have a bright future. Yeah, actually, I agree that uh, renewable energy is uh, still a uh, uh, hardly, it could hardly compete to conventional energy at, at the moment uh, because uh, technologies are still uh, a little bit too much expensive if you, if you compare to uh, uh, technologies which are, are used uh, for 50 years already. But, but uh, there are uh, such uh, things like uh, external benefits of renewable energy. That means that uh, when you produce uh, power and heat uh, from renewable energy, you create a green jobs in the country. Like if we talk, for example, about uh, pioneer of renewable energy in, in Europe, uh, Germany, so they have already created uh, half a million of uh, green jobs. So people who are working uh, in companies who produces technologies, uh, wind power plants, uh, solar power uh, panels and uh, biomass power plants, and and supplying a biomass to power plants. So it's, uh, it's, it's, it's actually the same in Lithuania. So if we take a, 
for example, cost of power and cost of biomass. So 80% of the cost of biomass goes back to the national economy. That means uh, that this money are paid to uh, uh, employees working in biomass supply companies. These are also taxes paid directly to the state. Uh, it's also a profit of uh, uh, forest owners, uh, landowners, and so on. So if so, so the problem is uh, that uh, everybody gets additional money is people, state, but not uh, the investor into the biomass uh, power plant. So that means uh, that uh, this uh, money should somehow to be shared between a uh, state and, uh, and the investor. And uh, this share of the money is called a subsidy. So that means that part of the benefit of society goes to the uh, investor. Mm -hmm. So and uh, also we can talk about uh, external cost, not only about external benefits. So it's another it's another topic. <laughs> What's your insight on this? Well, I'm always a little suspicious of claims that green or non-green petroleum-based projects. We see this with the Keystone Pipeline in the United States. Uh, proponents of such projects always, in my experience overestimate the number of people that are going to be employed either directly or indirectly by these projects. Oil and natural gas are capital intensive uh, development uh, schemes and energy sources, but in many instances so are green um, projects, at least in the United States, particularly wind. Um, we do not see that many people employed. So. Just as far as the employment statistics go, just about all energy sources seem to be very capital-based and not so much uh, uh, labor-based, it has been, has been my experience. Uh, outside, of, outside of that, subsidies, uh, I, I agree that having private subsidies, investors you say, would make perhaps uh, people more responsive to whether the projects are getting done. When it's just government money that's being spent on projects, then that money we've seen with the Solyndra um, disaster in the United States, it was a financial catastrophe related to uh, um, solar. And it turned out this government money just uh, went to, um, not to get a solar project done really, but it went into some people's pockets. When there are private investors, then there's more people watching. And I think perhaps you'd see more transparency in project development because people would be very interested to see where their private money is going as opposed to tax money, which can get thrown around and nobody really knows the destination of it. So I guess I agree with some of what yeah, you said. Yes, uh, sure, it's, it should be calculated anyway. And uh, mm -hmm. it's, just, it's just, you don't have to, to forget uh, uh, you, uh, that, uh, um, Uh, there is such a thing like uh, external benefit, but on another side, you cannot develop develop green energy just because that's green. <laughs> Sorry. Mm -hmm. that, that, that's my idea. If I no. may throw in some more more questions in, in this topic, uh, usually the market decides what is competitive and what is not. Mm -hmm. And sometimes, especially now, for example, in Lithuania, we have uh, a lot of. Um, a lot of uh, mm, un, uh, unhappiness uh, with uh, new government, which suddenly changed the rules, because uh, it had the previous government uh, allowed to to have uh, allowed to have uh, reasonable expectations that today's investment, for example, in solar plants, will be paid off in six or seven or eight years because the tariff was fixed and we, we, uh, we expect, uh, the investors expected that it will be fixed for another 12 years. Now this, this government changed this and uh, those projects uh, have to be competitive in open market practically without any subsidies. So, and uh, the, the argument for this is this is just another sector of economy that has to be competitive in normal, uh, in normal uh, situation. So, why we can't we can, why we take out the green energy or, 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 or some big energy project and say that we have to subsidize them? 
maybe we can invest more into the roads, maybe into the schools or other other uh, other fields and gain some external benefits as well. So what's your position on this? So that's, that means that we have to compare external benefits of for, of projects in, in the different fields and uh, yeah, as a state should do. It's a problem. Uh, one of the reasons why our government uh, changes uh, uh, rules of the game so often is uh, that uh, these rules normal is very often they are just put without deep calculation. It's just uh, from political point of view, like we need a um, lot of solar and no any calculation and uh, and then they create like a solar bubble yeah. <laughs> and then we get a problem not only for the investors but also for whole renewable energy we saw the exact yeah. same thing in the yeah. united states yeah, yeah. yeah. we like your, your your experience in this it no. it, it, it the, the same thing happened in the united states as i mentioned before some the spigot of money gets turned on and then it gets turned off and there's not a lot of consistency from from uh, political regime uh, or administration to administration, as we say in the United States. Uh, the fire president was from Texas, and green energy was not a priority, and so we saw low funding, and then the new president, uh, the current administration, is much more interested in, um, in these projects. And so then there were good people who came forward and said, we would like money for this project. And then there were people who were just interested in government benefits, and they saw this as the flavor of the week. Yeah. My, uh, what I actually I would propose for government is not try not to be very fast at the planning stage, just to use a time for that uh, instead of changing the games of the rule later. <laughs> of, co of course, the circumstances changes in the world, technologies are developing, and from time to time we have to change something. But uh, but uh, but you but s but still, you should plan as much as you can. So, what are the main reasons for a government, for example, uh, if we compare uh, United States and, and certain European countries, what is the main, what is the main driving factor behind those um, huge involvement in the energy sector? Isn't only independence of, from, for example, outside resources, or is, are there any other factors which drives this energy sector above all other sectors of economy? What, what is the force behind this? Why should the government take so much, put so, so much, so much attention to this area? Well, the the first uh, the first question regarding energy security, and people will talk about energy security and energy independence, and I'd like to highlight that those are two different things. Energy independence is where a political entity, a country, uh, or a state, is generating more or less all of its electrical and energy needs within its borders and does not have to import any. That is a very difficult uh, thing to achieve. Energy security with regards to maintaining the necessary inputs is much more, is less difficult to achieve and it provides almost the same level of, of uh, security and satisfaction. That is where you're importing only from friends or from countries that, that at least don't hate you. Um, for example, in the United States, when we can limit our imports from perhaps some, some of the more unstable regimes in the Middle East. Um, and we've done that, by and large, uh, recently because most of the oil and gas that comes out of the Middle East oil uh, goes to India and China. So that's, that's one level looking at in, in energy security. Then inside a country, the reason that we put so much focus on this is it's an everyday need that everybody has. The number one use of energy is electrical generation. And of course, nothing gets, at least in the United States, um, puts political pressure on politicians than not being able to provide electricity. If we have what we call rolling blackouts or rolling brownouts, that is an immediate fixation of public anger. And a politician had better be able to respond to that. And they know that, and so we have this continuing focus on an energy plan. Uh, we don't ever really come up with an energy plan, it seems, but we're always talking about it in the United States. Yeah, as, 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 as we told, it's, uh, it's external benefits, it's green jobs. And I could also mention um, 
uh, technology developments right? because uh, you know uh, the world goes from the resources world to, to, to market of resources to market of technologies and uh, and um, in 50 years probably the, it, it will be not important either you have uh, resources or not like uh, sh uh, gas oil and uh, and uh, uranium and, and so on it will be most important uh, what technologies you develop in your country and uh, how, how strong you are in this. And without uh, use of the technologies, you cannot develop that. I, I agree with uh, that. Efficiency yeah. is so important. Yeah. So, so that means that uh, uh, companies like uh, Siemens, uh, they will not develop uh, such a good wind power plant if German government would not support use of the wind power plants in Germany. So now they can, then later they can export uh, technologies uh, and and uh, and uh, country get a benefit out of that. Yeah. For example, Dan Dan Denmark uh, Denmark has a high subsidies for green power, but if we compare the price the, the cost Danish government uh, expends for this uh, subsidies, it's uh, less than uh, incomes of technology producers from export of the Danish wind power plants. So, so you, have to, you have to measure all, all things sometimes in different areas. Efficiency is so important, mm -hmm. as, as you just described. It's when a country is generating its gross domestic product, it's, yeah, every dollar of that, of course, requires a certain amount of energy, and an economist can back that out. Of, of, the, of the equation, as it were, and say, well, for each dollar or uh, euro of GDP that we create, it costs this amount of energy to do that. Lowering that amount through uh, use of smart grid technology, making your electrical grid uh, much more uh, efficient, um, perhaps investing in battery technology so that you can save, generate money or generate power overnight, maybe store a portion of it, and then that way you wouldn't need to be, have your peak generation demand be uh, as nearly as high so you'd have all these uh, base run plants and then your wind and everything stacked so that you could take care of that peak. If you can lower that peak, that's an efficiency gain that can be made. And to tie it back into the first question, I think it's important that there be a steady, sensible um, government subsidy scheme that isn't so much dependent on whatever political wind is blowing that day, but is also mindful that if you, you can't throw, just throw money at it, because if you do, then you have the law of diminishing returns again. So if you, would, if you can summarize this, this first part, so, is there any model around which can be used uh, in order to arrange the sub subsidies part, the development part, the public interest? So, how how can we where can we put the line? Is there any uh, unified regime where we can say that this is our goal to achieve that we subsidize some part of it and the other part is left for a market to decide? So, what's what what's your mind on this? <laughs> I think I think that uh, every country is different. Uh, so, so there are no similar countries in the world, uh, and the situation is completely different in a country like Lithuania and a country like the United States. And it's also talking about uh, dependence on external energy supply. It's uh, talking about uh, uh, nature conditions. For example, Lithuania has very nice nature conditions for renewable energy and. Uh, lot of places for wind power, uh, biomass, and, and, uh, and so on. And uh, also on uh, market prices of conventional power and heat. It's a, a very different uh, situation. In, for example, in the UK it's much higher than in, uh, Scand in Scandinavian countries. And uh, also um, willingness of people to pay and also uh, ability of people to pay additional is also uh, tech, uh, companies how, how many companies you have producing technologies in your country so there are very different situations in different countries and every country has to find their own best way I think I would agree with mm -hmm. that it's mm -hmm. very 
country specific or if the country gets very big and then you might have to split into regions or states as in the United States. Uh, I am suspicious of any plan where a government or like the European Union says, well, by 2020, we want every country to have a, have a plan to get to this particular level. And it's almost some, some kind of a centralized planning scheme that uh, it sounds good for headlines and it sounds good to say behind a podium, but I don't think that that's a very good way to do it. I, I, I would more prefer a more project-based where a government agency that's going to assist perhaps investors said we have this specific problem we want to solve. We want a wind farm that can be built for this amount of money that can produce this amount of energy and supply it, have an electrical grid that can feed it into the city for this amount of money. Who can do this the most in, in the most efficient way instead of just kind of uh, pursuing some distant goal of 10 years from now being uh, generating 20% from what we consider to be renewable or not. A little bit more realistic, yeah, project politi driven. Yeah, politicians, they like uh, having a flex. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I think, uh, think uh, we agree that we have to be uh, uh, country minded and we have to, to take into account uh, certain certain situation in, in, in the country and, and all the countries are different. And uh, the next topic, uh, as we come up, uh, come out of this uh, more economy-based discussion, I would like to turn your attention to environment. And uh, environment uh, from both sides. From one side, uh, we say that we need uh, renewable, uh, renewable energy to fight uh, global warming and uh, we need to, to, to take more uh, more technology into this new new possibilities to produce uh, greener energy, but from other side we have some local environmental structures which are harmed by those green projects which are installed. For example, we have uh, we have um, uh, communities near uh, the sea where winds are excellent to build wind power plants, and those local communities suffer from uh, huge wind power plants that are built next to, to, to their residential areas mm -hmm. because of ultrasound, infrasound, uh, there is also not so deeply uh, uh, researched uh, effect of huge wind power plants to birds, migration, and etc. So and some people just think they're ugly. Yes. <laughs> so what, what's your insight on this? Uh, how can we manage this environmental effect that on one side uh, uh, let us, uh, allows us to decrease the CO2 emissions, but on the other side it affects local uh, communities and, and, and uh, puts some pressure on them? With regards to local communities in the United States, we have uh, a regime where, certainly with minerals, they're, they're privately owned. Most, 70% uh, of the land area is privately owned minerals. So we don't, uh, we're different than most of Europe in that respect. But what we also see in the United States among surface owners with regards to windmills or other projects like that is money to the surface owner for developing has a way of curing all ills. And Texas has gone, the southern, south central state of Texas has gone on to be the highest producer of wind energy among all the states in the United States, primarily because wind companies could approach landowners and say, we would like to take a long-term lease on your land and we will pay you this amount of money up front and we will call a bonus and we'll come up with some scheme whereby Every, uh, every unit of energy we create, perhaps you'll get a, a small fraction of profit from that, maybe perhaps called a royalty. That, that, of course, makes the owner of the land on which the installations are put happy, and you can melt uh, resistance that way. However, there's going to be people who are going to be affected by this that don't own the land on which the windmill is. So, so the, the neighbor next door now has to look through windmills or he has to deal with uh, traffic and, and whatnot. In some states in the United States, they've responded with what are called surface damage acts, which means that if an energy company does damage to your surface, then they have to pay you for whatever they do. Knock down a barn, they have to pay a certain amount of money. Uh, knock down a fence, they gotta pay some money. That's kind of a remedial way to, to lessen resistance. 
there'll always be well rich people that can stop these projects. We see they wanted to put windmills on Massachusetts Peninsula by Boston, and that was stopped. There's a lot of well-heeled interests out there. Yeah. Actually, this uh, NIMBY, not in my backyard, uh, think it's uh, very international. <laughs> it's, it's, uh, you can find the same in, uh, in Massachusetts and in Lithuania. So it's, nobody likes actually that somebody else constructs something nearby your fence. So, and uh, uh, I, there are some solutions. I like actually Danish solution. So when uh, your neighbor construct a windmill, so you have a um, possibility to buy out uh, shares of the company who owns the windmill. I see. So that means uh, that you, you, you will automatically uh, become uh, some small owner of a uh, windmill which is standing uh, besides. So, and uh, when you see to the rotating windmill and you know that uh, every you know, rotation means some euros, liters to your cash, uh, to, 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 to you, that means uh, it's okay, it's, it's, then it's not so bad. So, yeah. <laughs> well, it's yeah. money is a, is a good cure there, yeah. <laughs> as it is in the United States. And, yeah, and, and, uh, and uh, it's, it's just important to have the standard rules for that. Yeah. Because if you don't have the standard rules, so then you have a lot of speculation about that. So, so, and people, they normally they like much more than uh, they could get out of that. So, because, uh, so, so, so my proposal would be to develop as standard as it is possible solutions for sharing a benefit of this uh, um, windmill or mm -hmm. shale gas uh, uh, mine or whatever. So yeah. In so, some of the energy development, even shale gas or green energy projects in the United States, primarily shale gas because it has a lot of road use, people who aren't making money don't like to put up with the effects of their roads being beaten apart by trucks or the occasional pollution stream that gets into a, a, a river or, or something like that. Um, when you set up a benefit for them that they can see, such as we're going to tax these operators and we're going to use that money to rebuild the roads and even make them better than they were before. Or to build a, something simple like a school. We'll, we'll take your old school and we'll rebuild it and now you're, even if you don't own any land and you're not getting any direct benefit from the mineral companies for shale gas development, then your children are going to a new school. Then uh, that is a way to melt resistance. We've had people on the environmental side in the United States complain that, well, you're, you're buying them off. And uh, to some extent you are, and you have to say that uh, that is the case. You're, you're, you, they were complaining before, they weren't getting any benefit, and now you're providing them a benefit, maybe you've bought them off. But to some extent all life is like that, I suppose. Uh, um, when, you have a, when you have a vested interest, then perhaps you'd be more for it. Um, in the aggregate, these shale projects and natural gas in the United States have had a profound effect on the coming decrease in coal use in the United States. We're going to, we're seeing coal drop off almost like a roller coaster down uh, and natural gas come up. And the net effect is that uh, our CO2 emissions are, are, are going down for such a large country. It's, it's a real benefit. So we have a green benefit perhaps of moving away from coal towards natural gas and then we have a more local benefit of these companies coming in and then perhaps providing uh, secondary um, I improvements for, that everyone can enjoy, and not just the landowner. Yeah, so actually, it's, it's just I should note that uh, United States, th there are not so discussions about CO2 in the United States, but they're reducing CO2 emissions. And the uh, European Union, they discuss a lot of, about CO2 and, re and the emissions are increasing. <laughs> so it's, it's, well, it's a paradox. Right? I think one problem with that is to, to cut in as an aside, you had Germany say that they were going to close their nuclear power plants by 2020. Mm. And now, in, in, it's nice to say that, but then suddenly you find yourself without this source of energy. And now, Germany, which has very high-minded ideas towards clean energy, is burning a lot of lignite, which is the dirtiest coal. 
Yeah. And that's perhaps not a very good idea if you're concerned about CO2 emissions. Yeah, we call it the intermediate solution. Yes, <laughs> of, of our bridge fuel, I yeah, guess. Sure. So, and I would like to, 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 to take into attention those, um, those projects which are really harmful, harmful for the environment. So, but they are very uh, important for the economy. So, for example, uh, we have some coal burning uh, power plants, or, or as you put an example of Germany. So, how can we manage uh, environmental interest, interest of a government to protect uh, the environment, and uh, interest of government on the other hand to have a more sound economy, more efficient, uh, or or better uh, um, energy independence, and etc. Is there any any solution uh, or any suggestion from your experience from uh, from United States? How can we manage this? Uh, uh, harm to environment and economic uh, economic effect. Well, my recent res research uh, into um, into that question is primarily at, at uh, shale gas and nat uh, natural gas and oil in the United States, and the processes that are used for that is directional drilling, which um, is a benefit uh, to the environment because you can have one pad site that can now drain a larger area instead of individual, all these individual wells dotting the surface. The second advancement in technology that's allowed shale gas and uh, oil to go forward is more controversial. It's called hydraulic fracturing, or fracking is the slang term for it. And this is potentially, uh, there are many vectors where this could harm the environment. Not perhaps in such an a enormous uh, one-step disaster way like, say, the Macondo oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico, the British Petroleum, or the uh, Fukushima, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. Um, there's not a, uh, a, a worst-case scenario that, that, that's that bad, but perhaps in the aggregate, you have to worry about um, unscrupulous operators drilling shale gas wells and not using the best available drilling techniques, not using the best available disposal of what we call flowback water techniques. Uh, there's real concern that if those things aren't done, that uh, serious pollution problems locally, but in the aggregate they add up, um, can occur. These, I'm, I'm a, I'm a, I consider myself a champion of shale gas and, and oil development, but I recognize that these techniques in the hands of people who are not interested in following uh, sound environmental practices can seriously disrupt local environmental uh, assets. And so what's necessary is a level of government that can provide comprehensive regulatory oversight but can do it very quickly. Now we have the benefit in the United States of having federalism where there's the federal government which takes care of larger problems and then the state, uh, interstate problems we would call them, and then the states. And what I have found in my legal research is that the states provide just about the right level of government to manage most, not all, but most uh, environmental effects. They can move very quickly relative to the federal government. And every state is different. Every state has different problems. I'm in West Texas, we have a shortage of water. Uh, so we have to be mindful of how much water is perhaps being used in hydraulic fracturing operations. That's perhaps less of a problem in a, a state that has a, an environment much like Lithuania, Pennsylvania, or West Virginia, where it rains a lot and there's a lot more water. There, you need to be more worried about what you do with flow back. So the, you need to have a responsible level of government, probably the smallest level of government that can do it, that can provide a comprehensive regulatory scheme, but that is powerful enough to weed out the bad apples, the bad actors that give the entire industry a bad reputation. Yeah. So you talk about uh, actually an external cost of energy. Actually, we have, it's a, ideally, it's a very simple question. You have just to estimate a real external cost and tax it. Tax with the taxes which is equal to external cost. If you have a risk, insure it for the full uh, uh, possible uh, risks. 
it's just a question uh, how can our society afford to pay for that, uh, for the taxes for such an expensive energy, which includes all these taxes and uh, insurance uh, costs. So, and uh, actually, in every country in, uh, in the world uh, tax energy as much as the external cost is. So, and, uh, and uh, normally we just uh, leave this cost to uh, the next, next generation. So it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a actually a problem of, this, of the world. You know? But again, let, let me come back to the, to the point I, I began our discussion. Is it really the society who has to pay? If we, have, if we are in a global competitive market of uh, energy resources, so maybe this is the companies, the companies are the ones who had to pay for this. And for example, if we, we can, if we employ a model of full expropriation of the land in order to, to give it to certain companies to use it, and uh, you have to sufficiently pay to, to the owners of the, of the land in order not to make them as uh, hostages of a, mm -hmm. uh, a, a, a big energy energy project. So maybe this is the company who has to pay those external costs, and if they are competitive enough, we will sell their energy into the global market. Yeah, but finally, uh, people pay for that. Because exactly. <laughs> um, there is a, a difference, perhaps, if you're bringing in an international energy company to develop a project from outside, they might be, you might say, well, we're going to make you, you, you spoke of uh, putting money up to take care of problems in case they occur. We would call that United States bonding. You would make an energy company put up money and secure it within some account so that if you caused an environmental problem, then the government, the host government, could tap that money to solve the problem. Uh, if you don't get that money up front, I can tell you that sometimes it's very difficult to get that money after the problem has occurred and the company perhaps declares bankruptcy or just leaves. So get the money up front to solve potential problems in the future. Um, we would call it a bonding scheme in the United States. You'd post a bond that would put the money up. Uh, now we have uh, this accident in Fukushima, so it's about uh, half a billion dollars uh, cost of accident. And uh, nobody can pay that. It's no, no they can't. Neither very strong, even very strong uh, Japanese uh, energy company can afford to pay that. So actually we leave that for the next generation. <laughs> yes. <laughs> they and, also. and in the United States with the Gulf of Mexico disaster, BP had a, had a difficult time coming up with the amount of money for that. Mm. Okay, uh, again, I'm being persistent, but mm -hmm. let me come back to the competitiveness issues. Uh, we ha again, we are somehow in a global market, and for example, the shale gas, you can liquefy the gas and you can transport mm -hmm. it all around the world. So in some, some sense, Lithuania, if you want to, to have, uh, for example, Chevron to invest in, in Lithuania, to, to ex at first to explore the possibilities to extract the shale gas, then maybe to, to, to start a full, uh, full, full uh, facility of extraction. We have to be competitive because we have Poland, which also has uh, certain amounts of shale gas. Mm -hmm. Maybe we can attract with foreign investment, a company which will attract, extract the shale gas and leave in a form of taxes or other, other payments to the budget, leave certain amount of this uh, money in, in the country. So how can we deal with this, uh, uh, you say, upfront money? It's a very good idea, but maybe it will make some countries uh, uncompetitive in serving this uh, uh, um, seeking, seek for the investment in energy sector. Well, uh, you're right. And every country has, um, just like every person, has uh, assets and, uh, and deficiencies. And you need to look at what you have to offer and try to balance that with the problems that you're trying to stop. Now, for example, so let's, what is that sounds kind of vague. Let's look at Lithuania, for example, relative to Poland. You have the, if I'm pronouncing this right, and I'm almost certainly not, the Salalute field in the southwestern part of, of the uh, country. That is significantly more shallow than the similar shale belts, Carpathian shale belts in Poland. That makes it much more attractive to drillers in the sense that it's a lot less expensive to tap those resources if they're there. That's an asset. That makes you potentially more attractive. If you know that you have that benefit, then perhaps you can drive a harder bargain, a better bargain on, from the government's perspective. 
um, with, with say, Chevron or, or, or uh, whatnot. Um, so you look for your strengths. And in, in that case, and it's over on the western side, so perhaps you'd be closer to markets that you could export it if you ever chose to. Um, you can also really provide international companies, there's a, there's a certain benefit from just stability. If you have a government, one government that's kind of unstable, and they, they occasionally give really good deals, but then uh, the regimes change, and, and you... Um, and there's another country that has a more stable regime that we know that the rules of contract are followed. We know that the, we being the oil companies, know that if we go to arbitration or, or court over a problem with the, with the whatever agreement, production sharing contract or whatnot, that we're going to get a fair shake as an oil company, then you look a lot more attractive and you make yourself a lot more competitive by just having sound rule tra and transparent rule of law and that makes you more competitive. So you look at your kind of physical limitations, where it's located and what, what asset you have relative to everybody else, and then so that'll make you more competitive, or at least it'll make you more mindful of what you can ask for. And if you can't ask for something that with, is within your realm of comfort, then you might not want to develop that asset. Uh, this leads to our uh, last subtopic of the discussion. Uh, it's a model where we can employ public money and people's money into development of large uh, energy projects in order to put uh, both sides, which are sometimes on uh, with different interests, on the same part of the table. Yeah, I th actually, think about uh, renewable energy, for example. So, there are in Lithuania, there are some. Uh, just a few investors into the renewable energy and a lot of energy consumers which pay for that mm -hmm. <laughs> and that's uh, actually make uh, some some tension in, in the field so uh, and therefore the renewable energy in Lithuania is not very uh, popular this uh, people we, we, we actually we don't like paying more and uh, for some investor who is just running black Mercedes and, uh, and yeah. says, we don't like that. <laughs> so, so if uh, if uh, we had uh, uh, 100,000 owners of uh, renewable energy plants, mm -hmm. so we will not we will not have such a big tension in Lithuania. That's the idea. So so there's some money going overseas to fund projects in other countries. Yeah, You'd like to see that done. Yeah, instead 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 of people investing in the pension funds, which are paying, uh, which are uh, of, um, in that uh, money goes to investment into some Chinese uh, governmental bond, uh, bonds. Mm -hmm. So it's better maybe to invest in their own economy and to develop that. That's that's another reason of such a in, uh, public fund. If you had direct investment like that, then perhaps there would be almost like a, a democratic uh, process to what, what, where that money is going to get poured into. If, if there are two projects that look perhaps equally attractive, and one project would perhaps harm the environment in this way, and the other project could prevent, present these environmental risks, then uh, you have perhaps some element of well, most people want this or that. And that's not to say that groups, large groups of people don't make wrong decisions. But uh, in the long run, that, that seems to be um, uh, the, perhaps the, the, the best way to, to, to get these things decided if there's a big, if there's a big uh, uh, problem. Certainly, if the return rate was such that in the environmentalists thought that it was a good, uh, uh, a good investment, then they could buy shares and then perhaps steer be active in steering the, the project one way or the other. I don't know if that's viable or not. Yeah, actually, actually <laughs> so if, if we had a lot of uh, owners, 100,000 of owners of renewable energy, that's also mean 100,000 of, uh, of voters in, in, in the, the Election. election, yeah. So, so that means that uh, parties and uh, politicians they would afraid to do something uh, wrong with these investments. That means that the investment could be much, much more safer. 
perhaps. So, so, and, uh, and, uh, and also core uh, of uh, big investors, they would also feel themselves safer if they go together with such a public funds. So it's almost, uh, as, as we're seeing in some places, a private, a nexus of private and public money yeah. being put into projects. And we're seeing that in other countries like Brazil, where there's this semi-public national oil company, their Petrobras, and, and, uh, but there's a private aspect to it. And there's also an international investment aspect to it, too. So we have other countries that are investing in Petrobras. Uh, that that's, uh, that I, I can see that happening in the future. It okay. could it could be maybe also then not only with renewable energy with other projects also so it's a, it's a you know, universal idea. <laughs> so yes. yes. Do you have something uh, similar in the United States, uh, for example, not only in the energy sector, but to attract uh, uh, public money to make people the shareholders and that we feel that this, these projects are somehow connect the uh, outcome of the projects are somehow connected to the wealth. I mean larger scale. Well, of course, we have the New York Stock Exchange and people invest their money in that. Um, and we, so there, there's kind of, the, that's the primary vehicle of private investment in the United States. But uh, we also have electrical cooperatives where we'll have um, a local uh, electrical transmission owner or operator and it's owned by an entire town. All right. And they have some capital left over, perhaps, that they can put into various projects. And we've seen in West Texas, these electrical cooperatives put money into building a reservoir, uh, looking into the future for perhaps they could use that reservoir for uh, power generation or uh, lowering, um, in the driest months of the year, lowering water bills. And so that's a, that's, a, that's a way that you can, with public money, kind of get over the need for capital, that hump, to get something built, something done. And I think what you just described could be a vehicle to get the capital investment that wouldn't just be taxpayer money that you don't really see where it's going and um, somehow it finds its way into the, you know, the pockets of people who aren't going to get the job done. There are, some, there are also some green investment funds also in yeah, the there United are. States. Mm -hmm. yes. But how about, uh, I think one of the last questions in this area, what about the management? How we can uh, find the best solution to make those, um, those funds and those investments uh, really sound and, and uh, not to make some projects that are not uh, very viable? I mean, who will have the last word? Is it the government? Is it private uh, management board? Or, or, or uh, what, what's, what's your... Maybe it's, uh, it's, uh, it could be... Uh, I, I understand what you mean. So it's maybe it could be a good idea to make it uh, uh, um, also with the private, uh, in, uh, large private investments that made it together, investors. I mean, so this, uh, that somebody should uh, think like a uh, use about the fund like a private uh, money, not like about money of. Uh, <laughs> I, I would I would lean more towards uh, having it be a uh, vote among shareholders, and of course, this the government would have its own stake, and it, it could vote, but it would vote like everybody else. And um, I I think that in the long run, that would be the best way to do it: is have it be operate like an international or a publicly traded company. Yeah. Okay, so I think we have a very, we had a very nice discussion, and I would like to thank our guests and like to sum up the main ideas that, that we have um, talked about. So uh, one thing is that renewable energy is very important, but it needs government support in order to be competitive and uh, in order to produce more green jobs and other external benefits. It's also very important that uh, this uh, renewable energy projects we bring technology development and uh, there is a lot of efficiency that uh, can, can be uh, taken out of those uh, projects that are being developed. We also talked about models, how it can be regulated and uh, how, can, how can we manage the different interests of uh, landowners and uh, energy companies. So, for example, in the United States we had an example where the land is leased for long term and uh, the lessors even have a possibility to have a certain share in, in the project in, 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 in a form of reality. For example, and it was also uh, we, we talked also about Danish solution, if you can call it, as it uh, if uh, one neighbor builds a wind power plant, so we, uh, our neighbor can invest 
into this and in order to enjoy the benefits, not only the cost of, 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 of this uh, huge structure next to his house. Also, we had, we had stressed that standard solutions and sound, uh, clear um, uh, rules uh, should be employed in order to make investors, uh, especially uh, capital, sense the, uh, where we need a lot of capital, so that we have a sound and long, uh, long-term long rules, uh, which has to be prepared and analyzed in the planning stage uh, in order not to be changed in the first few years of uh, when we are in force. And uh, also we have to, as a one of the uh, solution, maybe we can also think about this, employ employing the solution Lithuania is uh, upfront money for certain projects where a company which want, that wants to, to, to develop certain energy project has to uh, put some money in escrow account uh, mm -hmm. to, 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 to have as insurance for a state. And uh, we also talked about long run, uh, about the possibility in the long run to employ pension funds or, or public funds uh, uh, into huge uh, energy projects uh, in order to have uh, people that uh, are part of those funds uh, to become a shareholders of those huge projects and enjoy the benefits together with uh, private equity. So thank you. You are. Okay.